evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Fire Up. Are we fired up tonight, guys? No Let question me. about it. Go ahead. Oh, all right. Well, you see one less than normal. Ralph would normally be on. He's having some technical issues. So tonight, it's my co-host, Smokin' Jeremy B. And my better side of me, Scott, the Motor City Mad Mouth. I had to be on. Let's get to the comments. Blows. Let's get this baby rolling. Guess what? It is rolling. All right, Jeremy, take over. I'm trying to get Josh and the guys in here, but they may already be snoozing. An end of an era for who? Tua Aquavella? Yeah, that's his new name Max. down here with these guys. Max Spielman <laughs> has a signed Tua jersey. I have a signed Tua helmet. And Josh has a signed Roberto Longo jersey. Longo, so yeah. Really, let's get, get, I need to get to bed. Get yeah, to that's a good piece of memorabilia for Joshua, that's for sure. Have a big, he has a big weekend covering University of Miami Miami and FAU. Wasn't that last weekend? No, that's this weekend. Oh, this weekend. Last weekend was USF with um, Miami. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Scott. I said that. And he wrote a book, Josh and the Smackers. Just uh, got a nice, strong beer and ready to roll. What's going on? Well, he's in here. Good. There's one. Is on his fourth beer already. Yeah. That's a... What's going on, Joshua? Can SFT do a prayer for Jesse Stauber? He's about to hit, hit, hit by the damn thing. <laughs> I don't know. We'll leave that at TBD. I'm still starting to start okay. it now. All right. Due to what? Uh, these comments better get read. Don't worry, we're working on it. I Here, either. Jesse, I hope you have a flush bucket and an ex extra cancels and, of course, some extra beers for the storm. Candle, candles. Oh, okay. Now, now it makes sense. Somebody must be getting it handed to them by Scott in the pre processing. <laughs> You're hanging with some nice strong beers. Smacker and the Smackers. Door Joshua and the Smackers. Where is the SFT? Right here. Due to Hurricane Smacker, the show is canceled. No. Not this I, mean, one. I don't know what you're doing. You're looking at but this one. Song tonight. We back, we back. Orlando. SFTP South Florida Tribune Public here. Scott just roasted Ralph in the pre-processing. Processing Ralph couldn't even get the courage to come on. No, Ralph is having some major internet issues, and we'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, I didn't help the situation by going off a little, but it is what it is. So uh, well, I want to make sure that everybody gets to bed at a decent time, because after all, Candy and I have a busy weekend, and it begins tomorrow night. The Miami Hurricanes host Virginia Tech at 7.30 Eastern time. Our coverage will begin at around... 3 34 o'clock Eastern time before the show. I just wrote the story. Candy putting in the videos. Look for it. It'll be up there. All right, Candy, it's all yours. So first and foremost, we should say that we hope everybody stays safe from the storm. Um, this is a major storm hurricane going to be hitting. They said it could max out. It could actually top to a cat four. And that would be some pretty devastation, um, especially where it's going to hit. Um, so everybody that's in its path, heed the warnings, be careful, be safe. That's what I'll say. Yeah. Yes. Now, one, one thing I forgot to mention on some of my shows this week, but I will not forget tonight. Rest in peace, Mercury Morris. Candy and I had the opportunity to meet you at the last Super Bowl here. Mercury was kind of his time. We all had a nice photo with Mercury and there's a guy that was definitely a big key contributor to the Miami Dolphins two back-to-back -back Super Bowls in the 70s. So once again, rest in peace, Mercury Morris. Yes, yes, I remember that well. Going we to were at the Diplomat State. Hotel, yeah. We were, yes. So you're all wondering what the title, The End of an Era. For those of you baseball fans out there, you would know what that means. Because today was the last day for Oakland to be playing in Oakland in the Coliseum. Scott, you've been to a closing of a stadium game. 
But now this is much more than just closing of a stadium. They're no longer going to be in Oakland. Right. So all those fans, I I did witness, I saw uh, someone posted on Facebook that they took a sign to the stadium and it said that he was there for the very first game and he was there for the last game of the Coliseum. And I thought mm-hmm. that was pretty cool, but very emotional. So tell me, you, you were at the Tigers last game. Mm-hmm. How emotional was that for you? Well, you know, it's funny. It's kind of interesting when you think about it. that particular one, the Tigers in 99, I covered the old, I went out there and covered the opener and then the final game of the year as well, nothing in between. So the Tiger Stadium was much different. Well, know about the history. Comerica Park was being built at that time. So not like they were, all they were leaving was like five, 10 minutes away to go right downtown. But Oakland's a different animal. I mean, you know, Larry Beal of, the local guy who used to be at ESPN actually went out there and hammered and had a little bit of a rant of his own about John Fisher. And and it was rightfully deserved. I mean, you know, Fisher obviously wanted the politicians to go ahead and pay for it for him. And and you had the Oakland, rather the Golden State Warriors owner wanted to buy the team, but he refused to sell it. So he already had his, he was ready to go to Vegas anyway. So it's, it's hard. You know, they were in that area for, what, 57 years? That This will be the first team that's ever been in four particular cities. So, yeah, you always hate to see an end of an era. But this one here was different because there was so much hostility involved between not only the fans, the ownership, but the politicians. So it's a no-win situation. They're going to Sacramento. They've got a lot of work to do on that ballpark. And they don't even have their financing in place in Vegas yet. So it's a very dysfunctional franchise, Vegas to me, the way I look at it is headed toward being a four major sports town area. But as Josh was asking you to tell me about my time in Vegas, I used to go there a lot of times to see major fights and take rides over to Hoover Dam and the Grand Canyon. I think Vegas is a great town. I never thought in my wildest dreams it could ever have three or four major sports. But you know what? Areas grow. I, I don't think many years ago when I lived in South Florida back in the 80s, who would have thought this was a four sports sound but that just goes to show you how things really go it does yeah. it does yeah go ahead, it, Jeremy. it is the end of an era and yes oakland is moving to vegas that's where they're headed they're following in the footsteps of the football team and yes i will have to get used to that too <laughs> well josh was asking me what fights were was i at i was at evander holyfield mike tyson was one they had uh, Evander Holyfield, I think, took on Michael Moore and then Peter McNeely. It was one when Tyson knocked him out or did he? Who knows what? Phantom punches and some other guys. So I went to like four or five major fights. And actually, in that Holyfield Tyson fight, I sat next to the late James Earl Jones. And James Earl Jones was unbelievable. We spent time talking. He was very polite to me the whole time. And it was a great thrill. Now, mind you, okay. While I'm covering that, while actually sitting there as a fan with my ex-wife, okay, I ended up buying a fight on pay-per-view, and then Tyson bit Holyfield's ear off, and then my ex-wife bit my head off before spending 50 bucks on it. I said, well, wait a minute. This went 11 rounds. I didn't expect him to go this ballistic. So it, it is what it is. But you know what? Vegas is a great town. I've always enjoyed going there. And, you know, to me, sport can take away – will allow some of these people to get away from the casinos and don't lose it all that bad. You know, Josh, do I still cover fights? Not lately, although if an opportunity came where I could get more involved with boxing again, I would. I've had a lot of great pictures of a lot of fighters. When you look at Chuck Wepner, we also have Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard. I'm trying to remember James Tony, just to name a few. So boxing has a great history, Angelo Dundee. So I've always loved boxing. Unfortunately, it, to me, it's gone downhill and UFC has taken over. But I'll never respect that as much as I love boxing. And it, to me, boxing is just something else. So, Scott, they're asking if the A's will still – are they, they still the A's or will they change their name? All right, here's what's going to happen in Sacramento. They're going to keep the A's. But they're, but they're allowing logos for the Sacramento A's for 
a couple of years probably for merchandise, but they'll be officially called the Athletics when they're out there. When they get to Vegas, they'll be called the Las Vegas Athletics. I'm waiting okay. for somebody to go ahead and rename their team to the Gamblers when they go there, like in the USFL back in the day. Yeah, don't hold your breath on that one. They'll keep the A's. And uh, Jeremy, you want to respond to this? Downtown really needed that facelift with the pro teams in town. Glad they moved out of Pontiac and Auburn Hills. I mean, yes and no, because the Pontiac Silverdome was the house that Barry built. Right. And, you know, you want to talk about somebody that was sturdy on his leg? It was great the first time they showed the video of trying to demolish the Pontiac Silverdome. The dome had been collapsed. They had, like, uh, silver screens for the drive-in that went all the way around it that they were running in the parking lot. And when they blew it, the whole building hopped up and sat back down and didn't fall the first time because they well, didn't have the right type of explosive. Well, let me tell you, the Pontiac Silver, don't say what you want about the turf and all that because I, I spent many times on the field. I love the Pontiac Silver Dome because I was living in Oakland County. I was in Farmington Hills. I spent a lot of time in Highland. And for me, a trip down M59 on Sundays, I spent my Thanksgiving there. I loved it. Obviously, you know, people are acclimating to downtown Detroit. The t Lions used to play at Tiger Stadium, for those of you that want to know, until they moved to the Pontiac Silver Dome. But I love the Silver Dome. I realized the turf wasn't great. Pontiac could have kept them, but they were so darn greedy, and they wouldn't give the Lions an extension where it was a favorable. And we, and we all know about the Pontiac Silver Dome story after that. It all it went downhill, and but you know the Lions made the move they had to, and the Pistons followed them. As far as the pogo stick, I have no idea. Jeremy knows more about his whereabouts than I do. I have no clue where the pogo stick is. I mean, I've always said that I, I tried to mentor the guy as much as I could, and I gave him numerous chances, and haven't been able. And Jeremy was the only one that could get through to him. Nothing against him; he's a great kid, but there's only so much time you can give an individual until at some point you have to upgrade the talent level on your network. So, going back to stadiums closing, I can go back to County Stadium in Milwaukee. That closed. That actually housed the Milwaukee Brewers and they would hold some Green Bay Packer games there for a number of years. And that's when they decided the Packers decided to exclusively play up in um, Lambeau field and take away the Milwaukee game, but they still have a Milwaukee package that has for some of those season ticket holders that held Packer tickets at County stadium. But Miller Park was built, and now it's American Family Fields because they like to change names and, you know, sell sponsorships. Let's face it, money needs to breed more money, right? Um, Lambeau Field's still in jeopardy. The city wise up yet. Um, Milwaukee would love Green Bay to mess that up. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think they're going to get rid of Lambeau anytime soon. Um, well, they, they've been asking the city to do a bunch of upgrades, and the mayor has declined to do it. And the city that's offering to build them their high-tech, brand-new dome stadium is Milwaukee. And I'm not saying they will move because it has to be decided on by the CEO and the board of the mm -hmm. Packers. So it has to be put up to a vote of everybody who owns more than 15% of the shares. Well, that's the first time I've heard of that one. So, all right, good to know. That would be very interesting. I'd be, I'd be very surprised. I'd be shocked. Oh, I'd be I'd surprised be. too, be just because of it. But the only thing I do know is that the Packers would finally have a Super Bowl in their stadium if they were a dome. Excellent point. Yeah, they would. That is probably why they'll do it because yeah, it's profit sharing revenue of the Super Bowl. But, but Candy, my question to you is: Let's just say the this is real, a real long shot. Maybe it'll put pressure on Green Bay a little bit. But do they have enough hotels, Candy, to be able to? I don't know because they are so close to Milwaukee. Is closer to Chicago. 
Green right. Bay is so far up that that's why they would never put it up there. But Milwaukee is close to close enough to Chicago that they could probably consider hotels in Chicago as well. So, and it depends if they where in Milwaukee they would put a stadium. I mean, let's let's face it, the Brewers almost left because they had a hard time getting renovations of their new stadium. So yeah. it would be interesting. Um, that would be definitely very interesting, but. So let's uh, let's you know change our little uh, from Logan A's. There was a retirement that was announced in the NBA today. Derek Rose. What are your thoughts, Scott, about Derek Rose retiring? Not going into the Hall of Fame, hurt too often, but had a solid career. You know, obviously known for what he did in Chicago. Had a cup of coffee in Detroit. You know, it's just too bad. Some guys are definitely injury prone. He's had numerous stuff, but I, you know, he's a good player. I've seen a whole lot worse than Derrick Rose. It's just um, some guys just get snake bitten by injuries and you never see what their potential could be on an elite level. So I wish him well in retirement. I really do. He, uh, he, at least he could say that he finished his career in Memphis, albeit for 24 games. So he played at Memphis State, was a superstar there. And I could see Rose, Derek Rose actually going into coaching. I really could. I feel the same way. I think his stats just keep him out, coupled with all the injuries that made him miss as much time as he did. I agree with you. I don't think uh, he gets into the Hall of Fame unless they start making the NBA Hall of Fame like the NFL Hall of Fame, and it becomes the Hall of Very Good because he was very good. Yeah, no debate about that, Jerry. Mary, let's go to the chat room. Derek Rose was Russell Westbrook on steroids before his injury. I don't know about that. Dude was a freak and the youngest MVP ever for his injury. That yes. I, I would probably buy the second half of that. I don't like to sit here and put anybody on steroids and unless I have actual proof of that. So I'm not going to – I'll probably – defer against that d rose if he never had those knee injuries he definitely would have been a hall of famer and now that i agree with yeah no question uh, about that yeah, yeah I don't... love green babe to mess that up is one of the ones that orlando said and then <sighs> Corey patterson adds the fact they should be in detroit anyways i feel like your team should represent where it is and not the suburbs just my opinion and yeah. i agree with that sentiment too yeah, I like Orlando's comment. Rose versus Grant Hill, both careers ruined by injury. Good careers would have been an all-time great if not for injuries. Many years ago, before he retired, I had a chance to talk to Grant Hill. And I believe, I, I think I was in Orlando. I don't remember exactly where, but I did catch up with him once. He regrets actually leaving for Orlando because, obviously, Ben Wallace got the championship ring that he wasn't going to get. He just didn't think they were good enough. But Doug Collins had him on the right track and wanted to build around him, so... But Grant's done pretty well for himself, that's for sure. So um, Derek was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. His hometown Bulls drafted him first overall in 2008. The explosive point guard immediately became a star, averaging 16.8 points and 6.3 assists per game in 2008 to 2009 to win Rookie of the Year. He was named MVP two seasons later, averaging 25 points and 7.7 .7 assists per contest from 2010 to 11. At 22 years and seven months, he remains the youngest MVP winner in NBA history. However, he suffered a torn ACL during the 2012 postseason and subsequently missed the entire 12 to 13 campaign. The ailment was the first in a string of knee injuries, and he was never quite the same player again. Rose averaged 21 points per game across his first four seasons compared to 15.1 points per contest over the final 11 campaigns of his career. Well, there you go. You just summarized it right there. So there's only not more to say about it. I did meet Penny Haraway when Memphis was taken on FAU. What another super nice guy. I'm glad he's coaching Memphis. He's a good role model for those kids. Yes, Rose was very athletic. Watch his highlights before his injury. I lived in Philly. When that injury happened, it was against the Sixers in the playoffs. I was 
pissed. I can imagine. Hated Grant Hill at first. Just the hate for Duke, I guess. But immediately changed my tune when we got him. LOL. I think my hate for Christian Latner might have had something to do with it. Yeah, that usually has something to do with it when he's on your side, doesn't it? Don't forget, get got Memphis in trouble for getting paid, too, before NIL. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's kind of funny you bring up NIL, because that would be lead me to my next topic. UNLV quarterback Lucas leaves the program because he did not get the money he was promised. By coaches, right? Wasn't it a coach that offered? But that's what they're saying. They're saying that his coaches said he would earn $100,000, whereas he has been paid a total of $3,000 just for relocation. He had played three seasons with, oh, I had it just a minute ago. Um, who was it? He transferred from Holy Cross to UNLV to play his final season. And he played three games and he told them that he was leaving because they could redshirt him and he would have one more year of um, eligibility. My question to the panel is, and I don't know the answer. When they're talking all these NIL deals, I would think I would want something in writing because at one point it's you said, me said, he said, she said, um, I would want something in writing before I would commit. So I don't know if there is such a document I haven't heard, but can ULV get in trouble? I'm assuming that, yeah, that you and someone's going to get in trouble because if someone says, I mean, they put them in a whole lot of hurt because UNLV is 3-0 and right now. There was a chance they were thinking they could make the playoffs. Right. And now with the quarterback not playing and leaving the program, tell me your thoughts, guys. Well, bottom line is you have a lot of litigation out there because there are too many uncertainties about this NIL thing to begin with. So all I'm going to say is there's a lot of gray areas. The only way that you and right now it's an embarrassment to UNLV that this situation took place because it's not going to do anything for the recruiting at all. This is a black mark. And you just said it, Candy. They start out 3-0, and and all of a sudden your quarterback says, eh, enough of you. I only got 3000 of my hundred grand. Okay, there's a deal. No pay for it one way or the other. So I don't know if anybody can really get in trouble. I think everybody knows that the NCAA is a fraud anyways. You know, and that's why everybody's trying to go out there in their super conferences and more or less overthrow it. You know, the NCAA really doesn't have a lot of control over college football or not as much as it used to be, you know, because, again, the conferences are regulating themselves and you have the college football playoff. Now, everybody can talk about the Michigan situation and say, hey, we've got to vacate that title. A college football playoff, I have not, none of that. Because if they had any reservations, they wouldn't have been invited in the first place. Michigan's title is secure. But there's a lot of gray areas. A, a lot of these things are going to come out and be answered over the next one to two, three years. What they'll do through the court system. They need to get this in writing. Could this kid have gotten it in writing? Maybe, but wasn't it an assistant coach that went out there and told him about it? You don't do anything if it's verbal. This kid should have shown a little sense that unless I get it right, I'm not going. And unfortunately, the student made a mistake. I agree. He should have had it put in writing. Uh, if it's not in running right, writing, then it means absolutely nothing. It's all word of mouth. It's his word against theirs. And so the only way anybody can bring down the hammer is if he had a recording or a handwritten conversation. Other than that, he has he doesn't have a leg to stand on. And unfortunately, this is just the first time we heard of this. With the way the transfer portal's been going around every year, how many other times since NIL came out in those states where it's available have these kids been transferring due to the same thing? Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. This is the one that's probably gotten the most publicity is what it is. And, and remember this, too. UNLV and have been in news for different reasons this week. You know, the Pac-12 tried to lure them there, but they evidently they decided to stay with the Mountain West Conference. So 
this is something. So UNLV needs to get in the news for all the right reasons. Because once they lose that first or second football game, then you've got a bit of a problem. And now this kid looks much better. But I think the whole thing is flawed and it's, it's ridiculous. I do, but I think we're going to hear more and more of these. And so that's why it's getting publicity. And I figured we got to jump on it and at least talk about it. Well, nobody's questioning your decision to talk about it tonight. The bottom line is you're going to get exactly what you're going to get out of the whole darn thing. And that's this, a very vague response because there's too many questions and not enough answers. Right. Uh, it, it's too new and we don't know all the details. We don't know if there's writing. We don't know if it's a reported right. phone conversation. We don't know if it was just said in front of his parents. And at that point, it's still hearsay because, of course, the parents are going to stick up for the kid. Right. So you can't. There's a lot of ifs, ands, whats, or theirs that has to be filled in yet. Right. I agree. I agree. Okay. Jeremy, you got any topics you want to talk about tonight? Well, I, Scott wants me to be to wait on it because that's the Arizona Cardinals thing to see what the NFL does about it after they review the video that I saw. But it sure looks, and I'm going by the eye test of what happened in the game Sunday with the Arizona Cardinals versus Detroit, that Paris Johnson Jr., the left tackle, intentionally, when beat, grabbed Marcus Davenport's wrist, stretched and turned his arm, and karate chopped him right above the elbow, mm-hmm. which tore his UCL. Now he has to have surgery, and he's out for the season. And if mm-hmm. if it had just went like any other normal play, I would have been fine with not saying a word. When he stood over him and kind of did that taunting little gesture like this, and then walked away and then looked back mm-hmm. and saw he was injured and smiled and nodded, he meant to hurt him, in my opinion. Well, like you said, I'm not telling you not to talk about it. There's more. Obviously, we'll be talking about it in our future show. We're just waiting to see the punishment once they evaluate it. Say not to talk mm-hmm. about it. It is a cheap shot. How many times did and Dominic and Sue be accused of cheap shots? And many of them were well-deserved. He was always in the principal's office. I can remember how many times Jim Schwartz had to go with him to New York. And Jim Schwartz could say nothing because of the fact that this guy was his horse and he was a stud. I mean, you know, yeah. Candy can't like and Dominic and Sue, didn't he step on Rodgers for Thanksgiving? Yeah, he stepped backwards on him, and it wasn't a stomp, because I saw it in real time. It was a step backwards. But did he not go ahead and say, let's put my whole weight on it? Of course he did, because that's the type of guy he was. He knew he stepped on him. He just said, oh, now let's stand on it for a second. All right, and- Jeremy, let's get one thing straight. Hold it, dude. Hold it. <laughs> And Dama Kinsu is one of the smartest athletes I've ever seen in my life. Yes. He got Stephen Ross for a boatload of money to come to Miami. He managed to stick around and found a way to stick around long enough to win a Super Bowl. So I'm with you. You know, I've never seen too many athletes this smart, but Dama Kinsu was smart. No matter how you – wait, wait, wait. The boss is talking, and you listen. Okay. So here's the deal. Okay, there we go. That's all right. I, I know he loves it now. Nah. So here's the deal. Okay, Dominic and Sue is just a shrewd individual. I mean, let's it is what it is. So I you know. can say what you okay. I love the topic. I'm glad that you actually led on to something here that's pretty cool. It gets me going a little. I love talking about this one here. But and Dominic and Sue <laughs> spent more times in the principal's <laughs> office. And he's a smart individual. I don't care if he stepped back there and did what he did. I all saw what got him in trouble was his reputation. Right. But number one, I never questioned his intelligence. Number I never two, said you did. Okay. When he first stepped back on him, it, he did not do it on purpose. You could see he was walking back from getting up. When he realized he stepped on him, he made it on purpose. There's a big difference there because if he was stepping him on, on him on purpose it had been a lot like that lineman he stepped on on purpose before when he actually did stomp on the guy right this was oh i'm stepping on something he looked down and saw it was aaron Rodgers' leg and he decided to channel his inner dan campbell and go for a kneecap okay down with consumer news for you guys got hardware he's got money 
Unbelievable. Yeah, I did it on purpose. He did. So, you know, let's see here. I want to go to Orlando. Escribano, David Portnoy's got $3 million to come to Michigan. Yeah, they can afford $3 million bucks to go to Michigan. It's no big deal. We're talking about a kid at UNLV. The left because it, he's minus 97 Gs. You know, maybe he should have been playing basketball. He might have gotten more. <laughs> That's all. So. It started innocent, but ended on purpose. I get you. Yeah, that's how Jeremy described it. All I'm saying is the fact that he ended up in the principal's office and got suspended for a game. Wasn't it a playoff game that he got suspended for? I think I can't remember that far. Um, was it New no, Orleans? He was, he was not suspended for that one. I think he did get suspended for something else, but he was in the playoff game. Okay, I, I don't remember that. I, I, so I'm asking you. Because uh, that actually was the 2014 season when he stepped on Aaron Rodgers the last year he was here. But in 2011, he was suspended. <coughs> yeah, all I know is Jim Schwartz and Diamond Kinsu made a lot of trips to New York. And it wasn't to go out there and have dinner at the best steakhouse in New York. It was about a trip to the principal's office where Diamond can sue probably the I regret doing it. Uh huh. We'll put you back and all of a sudden, boom, he does it again. It doesn't matter. He was suspended the last game versus Green Bay before the playoffs because that of that hit on David Craig where he basically side suplexed him late. Remember that? Yeah, but you know what? I got to tell you, say what you want. I do miss him, Dominic and Sue, though. Oh, I miss him in the Honolulu Blue. I, I've been saying ever since Dan Campbell came back because he was a free agent all those years. I would have loved to have picked up his contract for a year, Chief, and then let him mentor everybody, because I think he would have been better than Michael Brockers. Yeah, but, you know, I'll tell you one thing, though. Yeah, I, I was hoping he would go back there under Campbell. But you know what? The Lions hadn't had an intimidating person, player on on defense since it's Sue until Aiden Hutchinson came on board. Now you have a character out there that's going after everybody. And and cleaning up on sacks and doing it clean. No, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> he is doing it clean. Nobody did it better dirty than Adama Kinsu, except for this Arizona guy. Although, who was the guy from Cincinnati? Was it uh, Perfect? I think it was Vontez Perfect. He was a pretty dirty player too, wasn't he? I remember right. So he's Which not one? getting he's not getting off of this show clean either. Who? Who was the dirty player that you were talking about? I, I missed the, the, the name, the other name you mentioned. Vontez Perfect. Oh, Vontez Perfect. God, you're talking about that's probably the dirtiest player who ever played the game. Oh, I think so. Yeah, that's yeah. why I brought him up. I, I agree. That's why. Didn't he knock Pac Man Jones or one of those wide receivers into uh, oblivion? I'm trying to remember who it was, but it was a pretty uh, nasty hit. Vontez Perfect. Antonio Brown. Oh, that's who it was, Antonio Brown. Well, even and, if he and the did, guy went totally nuts after that. It has to be CTE. Yeah, <laughs> even if he did it, even if it did it to Antonio Brown, it didn't help him later on. So you can tell that I'm not an Antonio Brown guy who's had more chances than any player I've ever seen in this lifetime. So okay. That's my topic about the Arizona Cardinals. And there's a little more film, and you can go into detail. And it's funny that Josh Gannon was an assistant mm -hmm. under Dan Quinn during the Bounty Gate days at New Orleans. You know, I'll go back to Corey Patterson. You know what, Corey? Good for, I'm glad he brought this one up. Conrad Dober was definitely a pretty nasty player in his day as well. I'm yeah. glad he brought that up. And, and, and of course, that, Orlando Escobarano talks about Bill Romanowski. Now yeah, he got some guys nice going person. back in the day. I like that. So he was dirty yeah. to his own teammates. Well, it's all right. So you know that there's always a "Did you know?" in my in fire up. So my question to you two: Do you know what was the first year in the NFL that they required players to wear helmets? I want to say it was 1934. Scott, do you have a guess? Yeah, I was going 1928. Players weren't required to wear helmets until 1943. 
Okay. Wow. All right. Mm -hmm. well, oh, man, they became what? leathernecks because of the heads, the helmets that they wore back in the early 1900s. I just didn't know they weren't required to wear them. That's why I thought it was around 1930. Well, let me tell you yeah. what. I could, I could relive a story like this many years ago when I interviewed legendary goaltender Jacques Vaughn, who invented the face mask here in South Florida. And for many, many years, a lot of players did not wear helmets until eventually they were forced to do it. So it's interesting that you brought that one up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jacques Plant was a super nice guy. Gosh, if I would have had a camera phone, how many pictures I left on the table. But it was still, I still have a story. I think I have that story somewhere in my archives. I had to work hard to dig it up. Mm-hmm. Game we're most looking forward to this weekend? Oh, go ahead, Scott. I'm going to let you take yours first. Oh, go ahead and go to the Lions in Seattle. Seattle's had their number for a couple of years. We'll see if the Lions can go three and one or whether they're going to go ahead and be two and two. Are they going to be in the middle of the pack? I can say the margin of error, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you can't, the Tennessee Norris division, as Chris Berman would say, is going to be pretty balanced. All right, let's go back to the chat room real quickly. Did Gordy how? Not wearing a helmet? Yeah, he didn't wear a helmet for a while. Yeah, when did Gordy Howe wear finally wear a helmet? I can't remember that one, Orlando. That was in the 70s when they finally required helmets in hockey, so he was playing in the late 60s and early 70s. Yeah, that's okay. I got a picture of Gordy Howe with his elbow on my jaw when I had, when I had it, uh, you know, over at the Pontiac Silverdome, and when Candy talks about the book, she'll be able to go ahead and mention that, too. Yes, yes. Um... I was just trying to look up to see when a Gordy Howe wore a helmet. So I'm trying to look. Um, Jeremy, what game are you most looking forward to this weekend? Any game the Tigers are playing because now the magic number is two. Right. <laughs> and they get the Chicago White Sox. You can have history in two different ways. The Chicago White Sox are still on 120. And the should the Tigers beat them one, two, three times, they're going to hold that. Lost his record all to themselves because they ended up the White Sox swept a series with the LA Angels and the Angels are just had the worst record that they've ever had. So mm -hmm. in their history. Feel bad for Ron Washington to have to go through that though. He's a great manager. And Robert Waddell throw some stats at the Hawks are 13 and 5 against Detroit all time and won the last six in a row. Beat Carroll's undefeated. All streaks come to an end, sir. Yeah, now you got Mike McDonald. Great coach, but again, I'm going to say I don't think the Hawks have been truly tested yet. Right. All right, you know, there was a topic I do want to mention that I really don't particularly like. Okay, so, um, since Ralph didn't make it on the show, I'm sure I'll save him the trouble. Okay, that's when Rowdy Tolez got cut before at bats away from 425 and he got to me two hundred thousand dollars should have come to him bad move pittsburgh pirates good luck trying to attract free agents with a pet with a petty move like that that was outright stupid i don't get that i really don't if i had a voice i'd rant louder but i'm not going to do it but four at bats away from a two hundred thousand dollar bonus if i were free agents i, I there's two words stay away from the pittsburgh pirates well that's more than two words Yes. Um, for the Any, game for... Go ahead, oh, Jeremy. 100%. Mike McDonald, D coordinator at Michigan. He's legit, legit. I never said he wasn't a legit coach. I'm saying the team has not been tested against a good roster or a good quarterback yet. They played Bo Nix in his first game, which the only rookie since 2002, which there were two of them in the first round that won their first game they ever played. That was David Carr, and Joey Harrington. Since then, the only other rookie in the first round to win week one is Caleb Williams, and it wasn't because he played well. Well, let me give you another, let me give you another game that people will probably be interested in watching. It'll be the L.A. Chargers against Kansas City Chiefs, but you know why? It's the first time ever that the Super Bowl championship coach has taken on the NCAA champion. Yeah. In the same game. Jim Harbaugh against Andy Reid. You heard it here. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I, we all we all know I'm a Packer fan, so I'm an, I'm going to be interested in because I think that's a true big test. They're playing Minnesota. Minnesota's playing hot. Minnesota's playing well. Um, I will give kudos to Aaron Jones because he wrote a thank thank you to the Packers and saying that his heart is still in Green Bay because that's where he was drafted. That's where he overcame a lot of obstacles and the Packers and Packer fans embraced him. But as we all know, he is now a Minnesota Viking. So um, whereas I wish him well, I just don't wish him well against the Packers. Um, I have not even turned the game on tonight, so I cannot tell you what the Cowboy Giants game is. Jeremy, do you have a score update at all, or for the Giants in Dallas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. fourteen to nine at halftime. Okay. And Orlando, I agree. Minnesota's D does look legit. Legit. I think, and I have not heard whether Love will be back. Um, there have been some them some talk that they might go to a two quarterback kind of system, like. Um, and that might be very interesting because they are two very different quarterbacks. Right. They're talking about incorporating the Wildcat with Willis is what yeah. they're talking about doing because of his running ability. But at the same time, Jordan Love is taking team practice this week and mm -hmm. signs. It, it's a 75% chance that he starts because he's throwing and looking good in practice right now. Well, the reason so, why that's that, that that for me. She's from that. She's from that state. I'm not going to knock somebody from being from their state. The reason why the Vikings defense looks great is because of Brian Flores. He's been a defensive genius everywhere. And I'll say this, like I said on Inside the Pitkin a couple of days ago, I would sit love another week if you can. Let Malik Willis go the entire game. That's just me because you don't want to take any chances. Malik Willis right now is two and zero. Oh. So you know, again, what they do. I'm not a coach. I'm a, I'm here on these shows, so I'm anything but a coach. But you know, you go by your feelings, and I have our crew on inside the pick that admit that Malik Willis is a much better body of work, and he's working with Matt Lafleur. So for me, I'd let if Jordan Love can you can afford to sit him one more game. You do it. Let Malik Willis go in there, and of course, if Malik Willis was that bad, then you bring in Jordan Love. But I'd let I'd ride Malik Willis at one more game if you can. Well, and I have to get, I want to give a little bit of credit to Matt LaFleur because he's a West Coast offense guy, let's face it. And that's what his, his people have been playing, but that's not the strength of Malik Willis. And he is allowing Malik Willis to be more like himself and letting him, instead of forcing him into his system. So I really think he's doing well coaching them. Um, so, Corey, he lived in Duluth, Minnesota, border town is Superior, Wisconsin. Trust me, I hear from both fans a lot. I have respect for most of the NFs, for anybody that roots for their team. Let's put it that way. I, I'm not going to downgrade you. I may not like your team, but I will not disrespect you because, hey, you all, you all are fans of some someone. So... Yes, oh, I have two Lions people on the broadcast tonight. And hey, I can tell you, I still I respect them and I respect their opinions and they respect me and I know that. And that's why that we're all on this show together. Well, let me tell you, I went on record what sports exchange last night. And Jeremy knows exactly where I'm going with this. I believe Caleb Williams is going to be a bust. I really do. I think Jade McDaniels is a better quarterback, and Jade McDaniels got a good situation with Dan Quinn and what they're doing in Washington. I've never liked Caleb Williams from the beginning. I never have. I never will. I think the guy, obviously, just because you win a Heisman Trophy doesn't mean you're going to be an all-time great to begin with. I think of all the best quarterbacks that haven't won a Heisman Trophy that have done well. So, you know, we had one good year at USC. was the eight and five a year ago? Obviously a little bit taller than most, but I, I think Caleb Williams is going to be a plus. And and I'll tell you another thing, just Justin Fields, he got his he got his ticket out of town, and I think he's in a good spot with Pittsburgh. They kept the wrong guy. 
I agree. Corey, I wasn't saying you weren't respecting. I know you were just playing around. I appreciate your comments and you being here in the, in the chat. Um, Andy Reed is great to adjusting to his quarterback's best traits. I agree. Malik will do well. Yes. Yes. Um, rookie's gonna rock. Yeah. Rook. <laughs> um, okay. Is it time for my town guys? Scott, you want to you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. My it was interesting covering my alma mater against the Miami Hurricanes at least for a little while. Close game, twenty two fifteen. Miami trailed one time, fifteen to fourteen. Ran off thirty six unanswered points, fifty to fifteen. Well, you know what? I enjoyed being at the game. I knew I was never going to lose. But as far as I'm concerned, if you're a USF and you're playing Bethune Cookman and blowing them out, Southern Miss, and then you lose to Alabama, I saw the USF team I had to see because that competition to me is what it is. Okay. Bethune Cookman University, seriously? I mean, they go on the road and get their butt stumped all the time. Bethune Cookman to me looks like the Washington, what is it, the Washington Generals when they lose to the Harlem Globetrotters? Really? Seriously? But then Cookman University. So, you know, but Miami, on the other hand, playing Virginia Tech. Katie and I will be there for this one tomorrow night, 7.30 Eastern time. We'll be there around 4, 3.30 Eastern time to do a lot of preliminary. Cam Ward's real special. He really, really is. And I'm going to tell you something. If the Hurricanes could stay on the roll that they are, they're number eighth in the country. So we'll see if they can keep it going. Miami's known for their quick starts. I hope the Canes can continue. Another score I do want to bring up as an update for Detroit Tiger fans, because this one actually does matter. At the bottom of the eighth, the Marlins lead the Twins 4-2 to two with one out. Why am I talking about this? The Detroit Tigers, if they could get a little help from Miami Marlins, pushes their magic number a little bit. Down, I believe, to one at that point. You have Kansas City took care of business, or is it still two? It's still two. Okay, well, if you, the Minnesota Twins will be closer to being eliminated with a loss like that because right. they're not going to have, neither Minnesota or Kansas City are going to have an easy road over the next few days. I think one of them played Baltimore. I don't remember who the other one plays. So, but uh, that's, Royals that's what I win their game today. So, what's that? Royals did win their game today. Yeah, seven to four against the Nationals. Let me go ahead and, and get the schedule out. So, the let's see the Royals will take on the Atlanta Braves, and then of course we know that the the Minnesota Twins end up getting. Let's see, I'm going over that right now because it is important information. The Minnesota Twins get the Baltimore Orioles, so the Braves and the Orioles stand up in the way. We'll see how that all plays out, and we know the Tigers get the Chicago White Sox. Orioles need to wake up before the Yankees overtake them. Well, the Yankees are in first place. I thought the O's were in first place. No, no, they're, no. The first, they're the first wild card team now? Yeah, yeah, I believe they are. In fact, I'll check up on that. Yeah, the Yankees lead the Orioles in the AL East West. Going into today's game, Yankees 92 up 66 down. Baltimore is in the playoffs at 88-70 before games. Okay, Yankees so will win the division. Them. Right now, Minnesota's playing for a wild card spot. Yeah, I feel sorry for the Yankees. They do this all the time. They either win the division or get that first wild card spot to only lose in the first round of the playoffs they play every time. Yeah, well, the Yankees right now wouldn't be a bad idea if they were able to get a first round by. Right. Then it, yes. at least they advance to the second round. <laughs> well, that's true. Mm -hmm. Smoking and what, Jeremy B., what's, what's happening in your town? Well, we already know the Tigers went from 2% at the All-Star all break, now to 89.6% chance to make the playoffs. They're basically in right now. They just have to clinch it. And with coming up on Chicago, it'd be so great if they give them, if they sweep them and give them the record at 123 losses. Well, even the record's at 121, but you have to tack on three more because they have to win their way in. The Tigers have been playing great ball. Baseball just winning their way in, considering where everybody thought that they were looking at a trade line, trade deadline being a seller. So, 
But, you know, again, this team fights for the final at bat. A.J. Hinch is making moves right now down the stretch that he would make in the postseason is what he's doing. And now you understand why he is an excellent manager and the Tigers are thankful to have him. So, so Scott, here's a question for you from Orlando. Does Otani pitch in the playoffs? Gosh, you know what? I would be surprised if Dave Roberts does do it, but I don't think they should. No. I think you wait till next year. You don't want to take, you don't want to press it since he hasn't pitched all year. I think he has to pitch in spring training. I hope they don't, but you never know what Dave Roberts. So uh, an update for you. The Giants just had a six minute, 18 second drive to score a field goal. It's now 14 to 12 in Dallas. They're in New York. In favor of what? The Giants? No, the Cowboys got two touchdowns. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I'm not watching that. So right now, all they got is field goals. Thank God, Gano is healthy again because it was it was bad for him when they lost the other week with the Graham Gano out. Yeah, but I'll tell you one thing: what you're seeing in Dallas That's is the fact that now everybody no. should realize how good of a defensive coordinator Dan Quinn was. I know, and how bad of a defensive coordinator Mike Zimmer is. Well, no, that's <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't laugh at that. You're right. Oh, you're I, right. I, Hey, Quinn got a job and he's doing a good job in Washington. No, I mean you're you're totally on target there, Jeremy. Well, you know, like, remember when we were talking about projecting who's going to win the division and everything else, and everybody in the panel that day said they thought Dallas was going to win the division, and I said no, Philly will because Dallas is going to regress. I said I see them as a seven to nine win team. It looks wow. like they're right so far. Yeah, I don't think I said Dallas was going to win it, did I? I don't know. Oh, I was I'm under. talking about when you asked us in the panel on Inside the Pigskin right mm. there. Oh, okay. All right. Gotcha. And I was on the show. Oh, I yeah. said, I think Dallas is a seven to nine win team this year. Oh, I, I can't debate that. I, I think Dak Prescott doesn't have the supporting cast around him. He's eating up a big portion of the salary cap. It's only going to get, it's just a matter of time before the Cowboys Absolutely. blow this thing up. And not getting Derrick Henry in the offseason was a bad move because the Ravens stuffed it down their throat a week ago, wasn't it? And obviously Derrick Henry stiff-armed his way to a Ravens victory. And I'm going to say this now. With both teams being one and two, both coaches are on the hot seat, and they're both playing for this win tonight. And you can oh. see it in the way the game's being played. Well, first of all, Jeremy, Mike McCarthy didn't get an extension, so he's playing on a – lame duck situation to begin with. All it is with him, we're not renewing your contract and he's done. Most coaches would walk away, but why does it take that last year's money and we'll see what's what. I definitely believe in my mind that if McCarthy gets let go, he's not getting another head coaching job. You know, if he fail in Green Bay and then fail in Dallas, I don't know who would go. The only way I could see him getting a job would be in college, to be honest with you. Now even John Gruden is looking to try to get a job in college because nobody's going to hire him in the NFL. I, somebody asked me who would they get to replace him? Would they call up one of the assistants? I said I don't know, but they got a hotbed of high school football coaches around them for talent yeah, that yeah. run great offenses. They could probably grab any one of them and do better than Mike McCarthy. Yeah, that's true. But you know what? Jerry Jones spends a lot of money on a few players. Some of his drafts have been pretty good. Yeah, but you know the one thing he does have that he didn't have a year ago is he has Jimmy Johnson. He's friends with him, so Jimmy. Might give him a little advice, except not step on the football field. I'm going to say this now. There's only one way Ben Johnson leaves. That's if we win the Super Bowl. Okay. Because he said that that was his goal when he was hired here to begin with. And he's turned down Buku Bucks this year to come back and coach this team as the offensive coordinator. Yeah, go to Corey Patterson's comment because you know what, Corey, I'll give you an agree. I'll totally agree with you on this one. To be honest, looking at Mike McCarthy, it looks like he could care less after dealing with Jerry Jones. Yeah, but I agree. I mean, there's, there's no debate. You just hit a bullseye with that comment, Corey. Exactly. Okay, my town. Kudos to the Milwaukee Bucks ownership for actually getting ex bucks player junior bridgman who buys a minor minority stake in the franchise 
Junior Bridgman played for the Milwaukee Bucks long enough to retire as the team leader in games played and performed well enough that his jersey hangs from the Pfizer Forum rafters. Now the basketball player turned entrepreneur has purchased a stake in the team. They announced that he bought a 10% stake in the team. When the, this opportunity presented itself, it just felt like a natural thing for me to get a chance to be part, not just in heart, but physically of the organization going forward. He is 71 years old. He played for the Bucks from 1975 to 84 and again from 86 to 87. His 711 career games played for Milwaukee ranks him third in franchise history, history behind only current Bucks Giannis Antetokounmpo and Chris Middleton. After his playing career, Bridgman began investing in restaurants and eventually became owner and CEO of Bridgman Foods, which operated more than 450 Wendy's and Chili's restaurants in 20 states until 2016. He also has become an independent bottler for Coca-Cola. His family owns Ebony and Jet Magazines, and now he is part owner of the Bucks. So kudos to him. He had a great career, and he was very successful after his career as a businessman. Those are the kind of people that it's good to see them investing back into what produced that where they started. So kudos. Orlando Escobano says Ryan Day equals McCarthy. McCarthy equals Ryan Day. Finkel is Einhorn. And if you know what that's a reference to, that's Ace Ventura Pet de Detective when they the kicker Ray Finkel was Detective Einhorn, the female. <laughs> okay. Anything else you guys want to talk about yet tonight? Yeah, as a, as a matter of fact, there is, Candy. Do you, okay. know, do, you, do you know an author on this broadcast? I do. Then you're going to talk about it now. <laughs> oh. You betcha. So the South Florida Tribune published a book. The book is Lessons from the Microphone, Tuning into the Enduring Wisdom of Visionary Leaders. It is written by Scott Morgan Roth, the Motor City Madmouth. Talks about his 40 plus years in the business and how the industry has changed. He has all kinds of good stories in there. He actually has some pictures of him as young with Muhammad Ali. If you tune into other our other broadcasts, George, you know George Eichhorn, who has done the sports exchange with Scott for many years. He wrote the forward to the book. The book is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kindle, Apple, and Google Books. There is a link to the book on our website, www.southfloridatribune.com, where Scott also writes and smoking Jeremy B. Wright as well. And I take pictures. So, Scott, how was it to write the book? I enjoyed it. It was great to be able to put 44 years all together. I think the outlining was pretty intense because you wonder what you're going to leave in and what you're going to leave out. But there'll be a second one coming out, hopefully in the next six to 12 months, at least six months. You know, again, when you talk about your, where you started versus where you're at and some of the changes in the industry versus how it used to be, trying to mold it all together is the biggest challenge i have i think the second book will be a little bit easier because now i'm going to be talking about changes and some of the things i didn't put in and i'm looking at a book this book is about 206 pages i can't tell you how many times i had to proofread this thing but we did until we got it where we needed to go plus i learned a lot about the self-publishing part as well second part i'm really looking forward to it we'll see the individuals that stuck around those that moved on and there'll, there'll be some call outs in this next book, too. I really think that not yet to bring up some of those examples. So anybody reading the second book will realize some of this stuff actually goes on, you know. And, and one of the things that I'll probably mention in there is I had an experience with a young lady that I thought had potential. And to me, she turned out to be a wash because she didn't couldn't handle extensive coaching. 
and she didn't follow through with assignments. I'm not going to mention her name now, but I wouldn't be surprised if I go out there and mention it. It's not about calling anybody out, but you want to mention specific examples. There was a situation with J.B. Ellis and I that we had to deal with a so-called TV network, okay, dealing with suicide. You can rest assured that's going to be mentioned as well because when you talk about suicide, you can't limit it to just men 50s, 60s, and 70s, or 40s, or 60s. This is a problem which is affects everybody. So there's going to be a lot of things where you talk about access, okay? I've been disappointed in some access situations that people have to understand that the access isn't good. So it's, the second one will be one where I'm not going to be afraid to call people out if I feel the situation warrants it, yeah, but I'm still going to try to provide updates as well about some of the mega TV deals that are out there that, that are actually being signed and as well as some of the fictional things that you learn watching on TV that you can apply to your own personality. But I enjoyed the first one. It was a celebration of what I had done. And, and it was also another way to thank the people that helped me get to this point. And mark my word, I've learned a lot from the first book that will apply. And there will be an audio book at some point that comes out. But thanks for asking, Candy. I really appreciate yes. it. I hope a lot of people will be able to pick up on that. And you told them where to get the book. Jeremy, I know you've read the book. Tell us one thing about the book that you like, you learned or you enjoyed. I like reading about the history of how he got started and how he met George Eichhorn and how everything went with them and where it blossomed right away when he got into his interviewing process and what he used in his writing. Awesome. Awesome. It's a great book. Go get it. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kindle, Apple or Google books. Um, get your copy today. It's $16.95, I believe, on Amazon. If you like the Kindle version, if you liked the e-reader, it's a little bit cheaper. Go get your copy today. Learn about Scott and how the media has changed. If And if you aren't in the media, it's interesting to read some of his experiences and some of the tri triples and trials and tribulations that he had as well. Well, let me add another thing, which is important that I know Jeremy probably came across. I wrote an entry in there about Frank Reynolds, a former ABC News anchor. And this pertained to the Ronald Reagan assassination is what it did. And you know what? He's angry. He said, don't, I don't want it first. I want it right. He blew a gasket. And you know what? When I went to the Arlington Cemetery many, many years ago, I went out there and visited Frank's grave and stood there for like five or ten minutes. Thanks for being a great member of the media. You, you are the standard for which everybody is made out of. And again, old school media, new school. I, I, I Do I still like to one of these days hope I could do a show at a regular radio station and pair it up with this? Yeah, I'd like to do it. There's so many things I want to do, and that's what I'm figuring 25 will be. I have aspirations to do public speaking as well. So, But Frank Reynolds is a guy, and, you know, I know there's a lot of these publications out there, Jeremy and Candy, you probably have seen them, that they'll write anything if it isn't accurate. There's no way I'm going to do that. I'll get out of the industry. I don't believe in fake news. I have no interest. If anybody tried to employ me with that as a requirement, I'd say, you know what, keep the job. I think my integrity or I know my integrity means way more than what what you're asking. I'll have no part of that stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. Relationships, folks. If you build relationships, you can get a lot of places. But And the make, biggest thing is you don't burn bridges in this business because it can bite you. The main thing that I've learned in this business is if you give your word, you keep it. Absolutely. Man of your word. And I think that's the one thing that which has enabled you, Jeremy, to stay in the system because I think that if anybody can ever say what their legacy in their life is, they can always say with me, I'm, I've been a man, I'm a man of my word. I'll stick to my word. I expect everybody to adhere to the same thing. Yep. Amen. Jeremy, how can everybody get a hold of you or watch you or? Oh, right here every Thursday night on Fire Up. Also. On Wednesdays on nofilter.net, if you go right. there and sign up with your email, you can watch Scott, George Eichhorn, and myself talk about sports in general. Then 
Fire up right here on Thursday nights on the South Florida Tribune channel. You can also find me on the SouthFloridaTribune.com, as Andy mentioned, where I write for the Motor City Tribune, which is owned by the South Florida Tribune. You can also find me on Kneecap Biting with the Motor City Lions, where I go live 9 to 13 times a week. It really depends <laughs> on how many times I get to be a guest somewhere. Yeah. You know, Patty Grimes, you are so right. Your integrity is the only is only really the thing you got. No, no question about it. You got to have your integrity. And you know what, Jeremy, you and I are and George are going to do some good things with that no filter. It's just a platform that we have to work on and try to figure some things out. And I think between the three of us, in fact, I know between the three of us, it's a work in progress. But I see it being a winner over the long haul with what we're trying to do. But right now, I'm glad you and George are my co-hosts on that show and. I see some good things going forward. And our show is actually going to be on, I want to say around 8, 8, 15 Eastern time on Wednesday. They'll lead, they'll be the actual lead into the sports exchange. Absolutely. Okay, so let me go into my spiel now. If you see that red subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner, click it like a share us with everybody you know. Monday nights we talk on Fire Up Florida. We don't talk, Scott does, with co-host, they talk hockey. Then they go to into 108 stitches baseball talk, talking baseball. Tuesday nights is inside the pigskin, talking all kinds of football. Wednesday nights is sports exchange. You never know what you're going to find on that. And then, as Jeremy said, on nofilter.net, Scott, Jeremy, and George talk sports. Then, of course, Thursday nights, you're tuning in right now to fire up it. We talk anything goes pretty much, but mostly, mostly sports. There is a book out there as we have been talking about. Scott wrote it. It is called Lessons from the Microphone, Tuning into the Enduring Wisdom of Visionary Leaders. It came out last November and it was published by the South Florida Tribune Publishing <coughs> Company. It, the forward is written by George. Scott wrote the book. You know, I have to say, Scott, I was amazed it didn't take you as long as I think thought it would. And I know if I were writing a book, it would have taken me a lot longer. So kudos to you. Good Thank book. You. Good read. It is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, Apple, or Google Books. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading the second part, too, once things settle down later in the year. Awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to that one, then. I'm actually anticipating working extensively on the outlining process probably around December and hopefully I'll have it done by spring because that's the thing to get busy with spring training and of course motorsports and I did lease a new van so I can go to remote areas that don't have hotels. So. Okay. Our website www.southfloridatribune.com has a link to his book. It also has a link to our merchandising um, website which you can get sweatshirts t-shirts hats you name it it also has the writing of smoking jeremy b and scott and my pictures it also if you like transcripts of the lions the jaguars the dolphins or college sports down here in south florida we have all kinds of articles on our website watch for scott's newest and latest we're going to be publishing his latest one on the hurricanes and smoking Jeremy B always writes a preview of the Lions, so look forward to those going up this weekend. You can also go to the YouTube channel and look at we have Hurricanes football. They're after their last game, their press conference. So Mario Chris, Cristobal, Cam Ward. We have a Xavier Restrepo, not from this past weekend, but from previous game. Go check out those videos. If you like to listen to podcasts, we're wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to advertise or sponsor a show, call Scott, 954-304-4941. If you ever want to be a guest on our show, comment on the chat room, but you can also email us at southfloridatribune at gmail.com. You never know when we might bring you on or what show we might bring you on well guys it's been real it's been fun i love talking sports with you guys jeremy you want to end us like you normally do 
Absolutely. Try every day to be a better person than you were the day before, because that's the only way to make the world a better place. It starts right here. Much love to everybody in the chat. Thank you so much, Corey, Orlando, Patty Grimes, Joshua Dorr, D. Blas, Alias. Thank you so much for joining in. Yep, yep. We appreciate glad to be here. I look forward to seeing you next Thursday night, same time, same place. Thanks, Scott, for joining us. We appreciate it. You're very welcome, Katie. My pleasure. Thanks, Jeremy. Until next time. Have a good weekend, everybody. Enjoy all the sports, baseball and football.